you know, was thinking I'm going to tell you a kind of technical story today about um, diffusion imaging and tractography. Can I, can I actually get you to raise your hands? How many of you have done experiments with diffusion imaging? Ah, oh, so a lot of you out there. Great. Well, this is uh, okay. Then I'm, that, that'll be fun. So I'd like to talk talk this over. And let me tell you. Um, let me tell you why I started working on diffusion imaging. I'm not actually. Um, a diffusion imaging gearhead. I just, that's just not what, what I really wanted to do. I'm, I'm studying um, children and children's development and particularly the way children learn to read. And I spent, an, uh, I spent a number of years looking at that, probably the last decade, with a bunch of um, really talented postdocs, very grateful for Mahal Ben Shahar and Bob Doherty and Jason Yateman. And um, as we started looking uh, at reading, we, we began in the visual parts of the brain because I had some experience in working on visual cortex. And there are parts of uh, the reading circuitry that are right near there. And so this is just one example. And, and as we kept going and looking at other parts of the brain, it's really clear that something like reading, as you were seeing in Jack's presentations, is something that requires a lot of cortex. It's not really localized to a small part of cortex, but it's something that is spread out. And you know, thinking as an engineer, you can't really approach something as distributed and wide as that without worrying about the parts of cortex that most people, you know, I do this too often, sort of cut out, which is to say the white matter of cortex. These are the way that connections carry the information between these places. And so we started wondering about this, and, and it was really kind of a, an amazing thing to me to learn partly first from the literature, from Torkel Klingberg's work, and then from things we had done ourselves, that in fact um, the properties of the white matter tracks themselves, uh, how water flows in and out through these tracks and around these tracks, and the tissue properties, the T1 properties, all these properties of the tracks themselves, never mind cortex, but the tracks, actually correlates rather well with how well kids learn to read. And this was part of a study, I'll just, I guess I'll just point here. Um, this is a study where we followed Michal and Bob and I followed kids over a four year period and measured them and measured them over several, several time points. And you could see that the development of the tracks, and this is the rate of fractional anisotropy, I'll say something about this in a moment, uh, how this developed in a particular track, the inf left inferior longitudinal fasciculus, but not other tracks, would change in a way that was quite covaried with the child's um, ability to do certain basic reading scores. And this has now been seen in many experiments by many groups and many times and so forth. And uh, the big picture for me is I'm wondering to what extent as we think about things that we learn and things that we become good at, like recognizing a friend or loving your mother or uh, learning to read, things like this, that those changes are manifest uh, in many parts of the brain, not uniquely by action potentials at the synapse, but in fact by properties of the brain that are pretty big and, and change profoundly and that the white matter uh, really, in our, in our hands, in our, in our understanding of it, these long-range white matter connections are important. They're not passive in the way that maybe these cables sitting here that are carrying the video signal, they're not changing that much. But the ones in our brain, those cables appear to be changing quite a bit. Uh, they surely change during development. There's a huge effect. And we're doing intervention studies, and others are doing these too, in which you can see the tissue properties and the diffusion in and out of these are changing in response to interventions as well. So we're thinking about this a lot, a system with active wires. And I have to say, Reiner, coming here, I particularly remember um, visiting with Leo, uh, who I would just like to remember today. He was, he was so, proud of, um, so, so proud of the fact that he, he kept saying how he brought you here. And, uh, and, and he did really beautiful work on this topic. And coming here and talking, I, I really couldn't say this without thinking about Leo. So let me say what I'm going to do in the next 20, 25 minutes as I, fin as I finish up here. Uh, to understand the white matter and what you can measure, we don't measure activation signals, right? We're all measuring structure of various types. And there's a number of different types of quantitative measurements that we've learned to make and I've become interested in. And I'm going to open up just by simplifying it. It was very nice to have Camille here. Uh, Camille Ugerbill, uh, <laughs> you too. 
And, and uh, but let me go over the diffusion, <laughs> the, diff the diffusion measurements a little bit and try to make sure that we're all on board with the same technology and that we know what we're doing. And then uh, I'm going to talk about uh, not the generation of tracked models, which I think there are many of uh, tractography of connections and those, those algorithms, but a new uh, way of thinking about how to compare different connectomes and tractography models. And I think that's really for us was a big gap in the literature, and I think we've, uh, or have filled it now, or about to fill it. And then finally, I'll, I'll say, if all this works out, I'll get back to the reading and what it is we're trying to do and, and how we're going to be using these kinds of things. So first, a few comments on just a little introduction. You've seen pictures like this of, uh, you know, an MR image that's a non, a B equals zero um, non-diffusion uh, image, and, and that's sort of the starting point. If, uh, if you know, you're not putting on any diffusion gratings, you'll, you'll see something like that. And then if you put on a gradient, uh, you'll see something perhaps at a B equal 1,000 that'll have a little more structure in this. And as you've seen from some of the other pictures, I thought there were good examples. If you go to 2,000, you can start to see a lot more noise, but you also see a little more directionality. And if you go to 4,000, uh, again, you see a little more contrast, but also a lot more noise. And so the balance in making these diffusion measurements is always one of getting a little more specificity in the direction plus a little more noise in the data. And boy, it's really for a guy like, I mean, this is, a, this is a nice GE scanner 750. It's a perfectly reasonable scanner. It's the kind of thing that most people do. It's really cool what's going to happen over the next 10 years. But I don't know. I don't, I don't really have 10 years to wait. So I got to do stuff now. Or, or, and anyway, these, these are also still pretty good. And to me, quite remarkable, the fact that we can do this. I should say that, that the, the direction, if you measure at a low B value, and you measure in one direction versus another direction, you see very different contrast patterns. And that's the directionality of the diffusion data. And that's really what we're picking up when we do these kinds of things. So this is a low noise measurement at B equal 800. And, and still, you can pick up a lot of information. So to summarize these kinds of, uh, these kinds of data, people in a particular voxel, in the particular brain, will measure in one direction, another direction, and so forth. And you can have uh, 150 directions or 80 directions. It's something that you decide depending on how much time you have and, and what, what's available. And you can summarize uh, what the, you know, the signal, the loss, uh, really the signal attenuation, how much the signal has been dropped compared to the B equals zero value. You can summarize this in, a, in, a, in, a, in an equation here. Here's the B equals zero case in which there's an exponential term that says the diffusivity, the apparent diffusion coefficient in some particular direction is related to the signal attention by the simple exponential. And you can paint a picture uh, of how much signal attenuation there is as you go and as you measure in different directions and show that as a surface. And this is all for within a single voxel, okay, within a single voxel. Now, now the fun begins. This is, these are basically the data that we have, the signal attenuation that we can measure in each voxel, hundreds of thousands of voxels in the brain. And uh, you know, in some directions, you have a very small signal, but, which means that the molecules moved, the spins moved a lot in that particular direction. And sometimes it's a bigger signal, means they didn't move so much. OK. So the first thing, as somebody like me, you come into a field like this, you say, well, OK, how well can we model the diffusion in an individual voxel? And there's a lot of stuff in the field. It's kind of arguments about this. Because I come in, and people are shouting at one another about this kind of thing. What kind of model do you use? You do, don't, do, so forth. So let me just say what the models are. And we did the thing that somebody outside the field would do. You kind of evaluate the models against the data. It doesn't seem right. It's better than shouting, no? Even if you move your hands a lot, it's still OK. So uh, the, the first model that Peter Basser and Carlo Pierpoli um, had us look at, had the field look at, uh, introduced quite some time ago, was a simple Gaussian model that summarized by saying, look, there's a very simple formula that describes the uh, diffusion in different directions. And it's a, a quadratic form written down over here, uh, which is also called a tensor. And they say, look, when you go and you make your measurements, there's going to be some parameters on this matrix Q that tells you uh, what this thing's going to look like. And each voxel will have its own Q like this. And that says you're going to take data like this, and you're going to model it with a smooth form. And the, for, the smooth form over here, this uh, tensor form is fitted in in just to this. It's a phenomenological model. It doesn't have a lot of underlying biology in it, but it's a phenomenological model. 
A second kind of model, which Larry Frank introduced in 2002, is a very nice model, very beautiful papers. I don't know that Larry gets enough credit for this, really. But they're very nice models. It says, you know, I'd like it to be a little more phenomenological. I'd like to go into that voxel, and I'd like to think that there are kind of axons going in different directions through here. And I'm going to model the, uh, the signal that I'm measuring as well. OK, there's a little stuff that's not directional. But then I got these axons going in these di different directions called sticks. And there's some amount of each one of these. And, a, and an axon has a typical direction and diffusivity. And I'm going to add these up, these sticks. And we call it a ball and stick model. And if you have to fit, if you have to fit it, you know, you know you could add more and more sticks and keep fitting it and it would do better. So what you really need is a little sparseness constraint on how many fascicles you're willing to use, either by using a cross-validation method or some statistical method for selecting this. And so you can fit this model to the data as well. And this, this kind of uh, form will have a, you know, a little more flexibility than those tensors. They can have little bumps and grinds on them and so forth. And so the comparison between these two kinds of models seems interesting because you know, the data look a little n noisy here. These are a little higher B, B value, and you could see the little things poking in and out in different directions. The model's still pretty smooth, but the sparse fascicle model allows for a little more poking in and out because of all those sticks. So you might ask yourself, well, how would I compare models like this? So one thing you can do is go get yourself a data set. I'm showing two, data, two voxels at two different B values, a 1,000 here and a 2,000. You can see, looking at the data in the middle, the one that's bigger, the bigger signal to noise, is at the lower B value, and then the B equal 2,000 is a little smaller. It's also a little spikier at the 2,000. And some people look at every one of those spikes and say, oh, OK, that's, a that's an axon, that's an axon. And some people look at them and say, oh, that's noise. So you got to do some model fitting to try to decide which those are. So here's the diffusion tensor fit to this data. And here's the diffusion tensor fit to, these, to the higher B value data. Here's the sparse fascicle model. And they differ kind of over here. And the way you would evaluate it is through a cross-validation. Go get yourself another data set and say, well, OK, which did better? Did this do better at predicting the new data set? Or did this one do better at predicting the new data set? And we're going to do that now at scale for hundreds of thousands of voxels and many brains all at once. But it's that, it's that simple, right? Nothing really rocket science, just kind of basic. I, I do want to point out that features come and go. So you, know, you see this little stick here and this little stick here, and you go and you replicate it, and it's gone. And that's already a sense, give you a sense that there isn't a lot of, that, that not everything matters. And the good news, which I think is fantastic, and as if I was in the core of this field, I'd be bragging on this every day, is that these models fit the data, real, both of them, fit the data really well. And what I mean by really well, I'll, I'll, I'll put some numbers on that for you, um, but they fit it better than test, retest replicability. In other words, if you take one of these smooth uh, models and you put it to the data set, and then you ask, well, how well did that model predict the next data set? And you get an error. And then you say, well, what if I just assume that the second data set was going to be the same as the first? and you get another error, and you look at the ratio of that, the model predicts the second data set better than the, than the first data set predicts, predicts it. In fact, that's captured here. Uh, this, the, please look at this axis here. This is the ratio of how well the model error uh, does compa compared to test-retest reliability. And the best you could possibly do in a system with, with uh, Gaussian noise is, is that 1 over the square root of 2 is shown at the bottom. And both of these models are doing really well, much better than one means that they're, that they're equal. And, and uh, th in other words, that the noise and the test retest, the, I'm sorry, that the model and the test retest are equal. They're well below one. And they're both actually doing really well. The diffusion tensor model is a little bit worse, particularly at high B values, than the sparse fascicle model. And you might ask why that is. And in fact, in most of the brain, and almost all regions of the brain, they're about the same. But there are a few regions of the brain, and these are the ones you always see when people come up and show you diffusion data. Look at the centrum semiovale. Well, that's the reason where the that's a region where the sparse fascicle model uh, does better. Uh, optic radiation, uh, they don't show you, but that's home base for me, so I went and looked there right away. That's another region where the sparse fascicle model does better, and we actually ended up discovering a tract in there that, for this reason, anyway, so never mind, another story. And this is just the compa comparison between the SFM, the sparse fascicle model, uh, does better in about 10% of all the volume of the brain. So that's what you get for that. Okay, so that's okay. So we're glad to know that. 
And, but I would say that the good news is that f these models fit the data really well. So don't, don't be defensive about the diffusion data. It's doing very well. And second, um, the fact that the diffusion tensor model uh, does as well as it does means that the statistics that many of you probably routinely use, such as fractional and isotropy, uh, radial diffusivity, uh, axial diffusivity, those are okay. They are describing the stuff in the voxel. So if you're taking, in my case, a reading study, and you've got one kid and another kid, and you want to compare them on FA, it's not an insane thing to do. But I will often go to meetings where people will stand up and say, oh, that diffusion tensor model, that's terrible, and so forth. Nothing wrong with the diffusion tensor model used to describe the data in this way. Uh, and, and I'm sticking with my story, and that's the end of it. Um, but I would say that there is a goofy thing people do with the diffusion tensor model which is to look at the principal direction and tell you, ah, that principal direction where the ellipsoid is headed, where, where that, that, that main loss of signal, that's where the fiber track's headed. So don't do that. That's a bad idea. Okay? But that's, I'm going to move to that story in tractography next. But for the description of the data and the comparison between groups, go forth and enjoy. Okay, so tractography matters to me a lot because I'm trying to find how these tracks go between different places, and I'm particularly going to talk about the work, uh, the, the first work I should have emphasized was largely done by Ariel Rokum, who's a terrific postdoc. I mentioned him, I'll come to him again. Uh, and this work here is largely done by Franco Pastilli and Hiramasa and Jason. And, you know, once you have the individual voxels, you'd like to understand how much confidence you have in the tracks. And I just did a story for you how much confidence I have on the models, so now let's do the tracks. And the usual thing in tractography is a kind of a funny story for the field is you kind of take your diffusion data and you put them in the tracks and then you start saying stuff about the tracks. And uh, the thing that you would, and in fact, by the way, for those of you who've tried this, some of you have tried this, I've, I know Allard has tried this, for example, and Reiner and, and so forth. If you actually compare different algorithms, they're really different. Uh, and, and people will publish, you know, there'll be 50 papers out there and they'll use 30 different algorithms and they'll be comparing to one another, but I mean, the algorithms are just really different. So we got to get on top of this, folks. So this is an example of two just parameters used in the same package from Mr. Trix, for the, this very nice Mr. Trix uh, package from uh, Australia. And if you just use two different settings, probabilistic on the bottom and, and deterministic on the top, and you just look at the, just the tracks themselves, they're, they're unrecognizable, they're unlike one another. These are the, this is the arcuate and uh, the CSD, the cerebral spinal tract. And the projection zones are entirely different. So we really need some way to evaluate which one is right and which one we sh should we believe and so forth. It's just, it's just urgent. So what we really need to do is turn the problem around and say, well, somebody walks up to you and says, I got a good connectome for you here, guy. You want this connectome? You need some way to say, well, I don't know. How do I weigh it? How do I measure it? How do I evaluate it? So the, the principle we use is going to be very familiar to you now. I've given you all the math that we're, that we're going to use. We call this the linear iterative, uh, oh, linear uh, fascicle evaluation, or LIFE, uh, linear fascicle evaluation. I need to get iterative out of there because we fixed the algorithm. And um, it, it works like this. So you go get yourself a data set and build a connectome. And here's what I want you to do with this connectome. I want you to use every possible algorithm you can find to generate as many possible candidate fibers as you like. It's okay with me. Just keep going. And uh, you can generate lots of false alarms. Don't mind at this point. And uh, then in each voxel, once you've got this, you actually have a way, you know, you've got these tracks in there, so you've got this way to predict what the diffusion signal should be from the, from the conventional models. Okay, okay we've, got these, we've got them in there. Go, predict. And uh, the, the equations, uh, Jack and, and I too, we're both very fond of linear equations because we understand them and it's a good way to go forward. So you can say, well, look, if I've got these, I've, I've got these tracks and I've got a prediction in there, you can actually just set up a non-negative uh, least squares equation to go and find the weights on every one of these tracks. And you've got a lot of these tracks. And when you do something like this and find the weights, you know, it kind of depends on the quality of your data. But a lot of those weights in everything we've ever tried for every algorithm uh, are actually zero. And what that's telling you is that the tractography uh, that you got returned, most of them are doing no work whatsoever in actually predicting uh, the diffusion data that you have. So that's good. But you start, you gave it a chance. Put it up there. Give it a chance. Didn't have any impact. Get it out of there. 
Okay, so then you get those out of there, and we call what the resulting kind of pruned uh, connectome is, is we call it the optimized connectome. And you've just got it by solving a set of linear equations, and that gives you a prediction of now for this optimized one, your, with your, the ones that had you know, zero weight or, or gone, you've got a prediction for what the diffusion sh should have been in there, and you go get yourself another data set, and you compare your prediction against the other data set, and that gives, you a, uh, that gives you an error measure on how well that connectome predicts this the diffusion in this person's brain. And that also lets you go and develop a set of metrics and uh, hypotheses testing. I won't take you through all that. I don't have the time for that. But again, this is a case where it's not as good as a single voxel yet, but it will be someday. But what it is is better than test-retest reliability. So in about 80% of the voxels that you measure, the connectome does a better job at predicting the diffusion in the second data set than just assuming that the two data sets will be the same. So that's really good too. Now I go to a lot of meetings where I meet with a lot of my friends who are physiologists and do, and do um, high quality anatomy and so forth, and they're all telling me all the time, oh man, that diffusion stuff, that's no good. Uh, you know, nobody can find any tracks. You really need to go validate it on an animal model. You need to do this, you need to do that. Oh, I'm validating stuff on animal models, very nice. There's nothing wrong with that. But I also need a method that will work on my kids. When I bring that kid in there and I'm studying that kid's track and that kid is learning and so forth, I can't go to a mouse model and start, and start analyzing the tracks in the mouse model and then come back and persuade you because it worked well on the mouse that that applies to my kids. It's just that it's good for something else, but it's not, good, it's not the thing that I needed. So uh, for in this case, I'm feeling pretty good that we're, we're in a decent position for saying which things we believe in and why we believe in them. And there are a lot of things we don't see. I won't see these, you know, the fine uh, articulations into the axons, into the, uh, into the gray matter. Okay, but I got what I got, and I can go ahead and do my reading studies and interventions and so forth and know what I have confidence in. And I'm just going to say that we use a variety of other concepts for statistical hypothesis testing about individual tracts. And um, this will be uh, in some papers that we'll say. So for the last couple of minutes that, that are coming out, and, and I'll be very pleased if you manage to read them. So let me say what this field is now looking like for me and what we're doing routinely in our lab. Um, I'm going to mention that uh, this linear fascicle evaluation, you know, it, it's helping us a lot to have confidence in assessing the connectomes that we get from specific equipment. You know, we can't run on your machines, we can't run on Camille's machines, we run on our machines. We need to know the quality of what we can believe from our data on this one kid. And this, this helps us with that. And that they're doing really rather well. And we're routinely taking these diffusion data now. Jason, in particular, Jason Yateman, um, developed an automated procedure, and there's a couple of others in the literature, for taking uh, the diffusion data and automatically finding individual tracks. He, he, we call this automatic, automated fiber quantification, AFQ. So we take these data, and we put them into a system, and we get the tracks. We measure the diffusion properties all along the tracks. And we measure other things, too. Uh, and in fact, to do this at scale with hundreds or thousands of kids in a way that we can compare uh, our data with your data and so forth is going to require a new information technology and infrastructure that I think is going to, it's just going to matter for the science, for our science at least. And that project I'll just spend three minutes on is uh, we call the Project POST, the Project on Scientific Transparency. It's being led by Gunnar Schaefer and Bob Dougherty and Michael Perry shown here. And and if you take these data, we, we're doing a lot of quantitative T1 mapping as well, but if you take these diffusion data to find the tracks, you can submit them in a way that I'll show you in a moment, and it'll automatically give you um, values. It'll segment these tracks. Here are 28 are shown, and these are the 28 we find basically without, without fail every 100, uh, the 128 tracks we find basically without fail every time. And the process for doing this at our center takes the data straight out of the scanner without any intervention by any of the users, and it puts it in a database, and then we have an automated process for returning these tracks. And that, that's easy. That lets people share their data because it's done in the same way and it's done automatically and so forth. And the, the way in which um, when we collaborate with people from uh, across campus or other places, the way that runs is they'll go and they'll 
um, do an upload where they'll go and take data set uh, on their desk somewhere and they'll kind of drop it over here and we'll just do an automated upload to the same database or we could take data from Eulish and uh, do an automated upload to our place here uh, and it's you know anonymized and pulled into the database and so forth in, in such a way. And um, then you go find it. Uh, it's just a normal web browser. You go click your way through to go find your data and visualize it as part of the database to check for artifacts and to sort of see the way the thing works and so forth. And uh, because we have it in the database, we can go and provide uh, a web page that shows what the analysis looked like. And the things that I've been showing you, such as the uh, automatic track discovery and quantification of the tracks and so forth, uh, also ha can happen uh, as part of the system. And this, the technique that we can use is we take one person, uh, like this one kid you're interested in, this one kid has an issue with reading, and we can compare this kid's tracks against the uh, 1,200 database, uh, other kids that we've scanned uh, from different groups at different times and so forth at our center. And so we kind of end up doing personalized or individual ev evaluations of, in of kids rather than group against group. It's this kid against the population norm. So we're looking at a lot of this, the statistics, the thinking about how do you do this accurately, how do you do the infrastructure, how do you measure along the tracks, what kinds of information that, that are there are kind of a big deal for us. And it's something I'm hoping that we'll be able to work with a team here on. You're so strong on these kinds of things. And I, I think it's something that'll happen a lot. And mostly what I wanted to end up saying to you is that um, I, I'm feeling uh, often that Camille and I were, were sharing this before that uh, outside of the community of MR imaging, you know, you show up and people are worried whether we've actually done anything at all. And uh, that MR, is that yet paid off or yet, yet or not? And I actually am feeling pretty good about the kinds of functional measurements that we're making for finding maps and so forth. And the, uh, the diffusion uh, imaging, for all the imperfections and the limits that it has, it does really well over the scope that we've given it at these, at these scales for these large projections. And it's mattering for uh, predicting things like um, when a kid comes in and that kid can't read and you want to understand why that kid isn't reading, you can compare that kid against the population and say, well, it's, in this kid's case, it's because of this track. In that kid's case, it's because of another track. And maybe we should design our interventions for one uh, way or the other. And uh, I'm thinking that's a kind of a bright field. And I'm hoping I'm seeing so many of the young people who raise their hands using diffusion. I hope that keeps up. I hope you keep making it better. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>